three, two, one. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the Long Chemist Podcast. This is episode 20, I believe. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy that you guys are listening to my bloviating opinions for 19 times, and we're going to make it another one. So my name is Johnny. I'm the Lone Chemist, and uh, I have a different kind of guest today, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, I have a guy uh, named Anton, and he runs a YouTube channel called A Skeptical Human. So I got into contact with Anton through uh, a video that he did, which I really appreciated, being a person who's studying um, chemistry for their PhD. My chemistry is related to climate change, essentially anthropogenic pollutants in the atmosphere. And uh, it especially triggers me when I see people that are not equipped to give political or scientific opinions that have no base to do so. So I really appreciated you kind of going into uh, exactly what consensus actually means, what the term theory actually relates to climate change. Um, yeah, I, I first just to, you know, suck your dick a little bit. I loved your video. And uh, yeah, you have some great stuff, man. Really, I'm very Thanks. impressed. Thanks. I appreciate that. So I just wanted to get uh, a sense of you generally. So do you have formal education in politics? Do you do political science? Do you have like media commentary experience? I mean, what? so what's your educational background, I guess? You know, it's kind of interesting. I never actually talk about this and bring it up because... Ultimately, I don't think it really matters what your credentials are. Absolutely. I think I think yeah. if you're making a sound argument, it's going to be a sound argument regardless. If you're presenting facts to support your position, it's going to be equally as valid. If you're a garbage man or a Nobel Prize winning <laughs> physicist, true. it doesn't yeah, really sure. it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. That said, I do have a uh, a biology degree that I got from the University of Kansas, uh, specifically in ecology and evolutionary biology. Oh, I big didn't bio. really nice. there you go. Yeah, I didn't really go into college like as if I had a career path in mind and I was like, I will get this degree so I can become this uh, in the future. I was one of those people who basically just went to college because that's what you do after high school. I didn't want to feel like a loser, <laughs> didn't really have any direction. And I just kind of got the degree and I was like, well, now what the fuck am I going to do after I graduated? Um, after that, I just kind of, you know, I, my, the process of me getting into YouTube, it wasn't like I woke up one day and said, you know, I will become a YouTuber. And I just like decided from that point on it was it's really been a gradual process of me sort of ramping up to this over the years. You know, I started out at a pretty young age, like 13 years old or so, doing a lot of debating online against uh, creationists, you know, like the atheism versus religion debates. Yeah. Did a lot of that in the comment section. Then from there, when I got a little older, I started doing just some blogging on a crappy blog, so blog spot sites. Uh, I had a little Facebook page where I did mostly like anti-religious writing. And then eventually one day I had the idea of making a YouTube video. I started doing that more and they were just terrible for like the first, <laughs> probably the first year. They were just the worst things you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, just like every aspect of content creation, I sucked at. I was bad at the writing. I was bad at the research. I was bad at uh, recording. I was an awkward narrator, bad at editing. Just like every every part of being a content creator, I sucked at. But just gradually over time, I've just always been looking for ways to improve, always trying to get better, listening to feedback. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a couple years that I've been making videos. And I feel like now I'm at a pretty good point where I'm starting to feel comfortable in a lot of these different areas of content creation. And uh, it's hopefully, ultimately, it's what I plan to make a career out of just you know, debunking all kinds of arguments that I think are ridiculous, nonsensical stuff I disagree with, whether it's politics, pseudoscience, conspiracies, religion, all kinds of stuff. I enjoy doing it. I'm really passionate about it. And uh, that's kind of my origin story. Yeah, awesome, man. So, I mean, I don't know if you still watch my channel at all uh, before uh, coming on the podcast and stuff, but uh, I do typically like film and media based content. And I kind of like a, bring more of an analytical or scientific perspective to that kind of medium, which I haven't seen too much. But professed, I've always been a huge political nerd. Like ever since I can remember, I've always been in the politics. And, um, you know, watching your content, like you present arguments like it's not like you're like a partisan hack. You look at the objective reality and the credit of the argument that you're actually breaking down, whether it's in a positive or negative light, it's a different story. But I've noticed from all the things that I've watched, you just break down the argument to its rudiments and you go claim by claim and you're very systematic. So it actually, it makes sense why you're a scientist and you have a scientific uh, educational background like me. Like uh, I approach my commentary in a very similar way where I just want to look at what is true and what is able to be interpreted from the data. So um, that's really great that you're, you know, you're a biologist. I mean, you're kind of on the dark side. I'm on chemistry. So that's I, well, okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't call myself a biologist. I don't actually work in the field. I, 
I have a degree in the field, but I don't describe myself as a scientist. Sure. Yeah. And ultimately, I, I hope and plan to become uh, a writer and YouTuber, maybe branch out into public speaking and debating and things like that. So I don't apply that label to myself, despite the fact that I do have uh, educational backgrounds in okay. science. Uh, uh, sure, but but I, I don't mean it as, as, a, as a pejorative or like a, uh, I'm trying to pigeonhole you into something. I mean, like you're just no, sure. like, like, like. As an educational person, I'm a chemist, and whether or not I choose to actually pursue chemistry, I think is a different story from whether actually I am a chemist, like in training. And you're a biologist in training, but you actually practically do something different. But in training, I, I would say you're, you know, a biologist. But yeah, sure. But yeah, it's just jargon. It's just stupid shit. Um, so I guess what really inspired you to kind of move your content from just the writing and the general kind of argumentative debative stuff into actual a medium of YouTube? Did you see like kind of a, a vacuum where you could actually put some content out there that hasn't been there before? Did you want to augment certain people that were maybe doing something that you didn't really agree with? And that's kind of that kind of medium. You know, I, I didn't really think about it in very clear terms like that. It was just kind of like one day. I just had the idea to make a YouTube video. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have like, uh, you know, yeah, you go, man. Yeah. I didn't have like an end goal where five years from now I want to be here. It was literally just like, fuck it, man. Maybe I'll just, I'll make a video about this. And I just kind of started doing it and I kept at it. It wasn't really like I recognized a void where I could step in. Now I'm at the point where I do kind of think about it in those terms. I, you know, I'm going to sound totally self-congratulatory here, <laughs> but I, I do, I do feel like my content is kind of unique in the sense that I go really in depth on specific arguments. A lot of what he, what you see on YouTube is people they they'll address specific arguments, but they do it quickly. They'll do a, they'll make a little like five ten minute segment where they're just kind of talking off the cuff. They ha, you know they have some good arguments and so forth. But what I really enjoy doing and what I think is missing from a lot of people's YouTube videos is just really carefully dissecting arguments, looking at every little piece of it, doing a lot of research to support your claims, really taking your time to thoroughly debunk the opposing viewpoint instead of just kind of like rapid fire, here's a couple points against it, time to move on to the next thing. So now I do think about it kind of in those terms and you know, the, the style of content I make obviously is uh, the way that I prefer to do it, but I do, I do think a lot of that is kind of missing from uh, much of what's on YouTube. Yeah, for sure. And um, I like what you brought up there about, um, you know, essentially you're looking for the best form of the opposing argument and trying to argue against that as opposed to what we see all the time with political discourse where it's just straw man, straw man, straw man and trying to misinterpret your point blatantly from the other side. And so right. like that, I feel like is so harmful to discourse because not only are you not actually presenting your ideas in the most effective way, you're not allowing the opposing argument to be debunked as thoroughly as you possibly can. That means more people can actually latch onto it if there's an, a misconception of how the argument's supposed to be conveyed. So, I mean, I really respect the fact that you actually look at, okay, let's break this down objectively, regardless of what I think about it, what is true, what is not, and what can actually be proven with data, which is, I think is, like you said, it's something that really is missing from arguments today, and at least in political discourse on YouTube and debates and all that. So that's awesome, man. Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep giving you fucking rapid fire compliments because I'm a big fan awesome. of your stuff for yeah. sure. Appreciate and, uh, that. Yeah, I, I love to talk about just... Um, uh, climate change, which is basically what I kind of discovered your content as. And, uh, you know, like, uh, I, you know, I, I have always been a political junkie, but I always thought my channel would be just remain a subjective force in film and analytical. But honestly, man, like the climate change stuff as a person who studies climate change, like, like, or at least chemistry related to climate change, like it, it triggers me beyond words that there's just so much straw manning and misinterpretation of climate data that is just rampant on you know the more the libertarian the right wing side of things and honestly man like uh, i've gotten into debates with people recently where legitimately they just have the most meme worthy arguments and it's freaking infuriating <laughs> it's like yeah so like uh I, I guess uh obviously we both are proponents to anthropogenic climate change and and you know the the main dial knob i guess is the the, the literal term that people use um what uh, what kind of debates have you gotten into about climate change that kind of uh, you know forced your hand, so to speak, with some of those videos that you've made? Because you've you've made quite a number of videos, uh, you know, um, debunking people like Stephen Crowder and all those kind of idiots that you know spout you know climate propaganda. So for me, the process is more just like. I hear a shitty argument, I get pissed off about it, and I'm like, I have to respond to this. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's what a Good. lot of my process Good. is like. I it's it's kind of like anger, irritation, and that inspires me to do the research into the into these questions. Um, often, you know, 
most of the time I investigate specific narrow claims, I don't even know like what the answer is going into it. Uh, so, something that I especially enjoy about my particular style of content creation is it's, it's as much a learning process for me as it is an educational process for the viewer. Because I'm, I'm doing all this research, and like the 18-year pause in global warming, for example. I went into that not having a clue about what the answer was, but something about the argument just felt off to me. Um, and, and so... Uh, and see, that's it, how you should actually approach a piece of data that you're unsure about. You shouldn't just spew it off like you know everything. Like, that 18-year garbage legitimately makes me furious when people bring that up because it, Yo, it is let's so, talk about what's wrong with it well well first like tell me like because you uh, you know obviously i i'm i'm up, up the you know, chemical and scientific literature and stuff tell me how you approached that problem when you were kind of researching with your video like uh like, what, what, what would you say that like uh was the uh the real thing i hit on the head for you because like obviously there are a lot of things like you know there are different vortexes of uh you know cold fronts and hot snaps and stuff but like how did you actually approach it where you were able to ob you obtain data in an objective way and not have it be this meme of, oh, the, the earth hasn't warmed significantly in 18 years, therefore climate change isn't real, which is what we see people doing all the time. Right. For me, the general process for most of my content creation is I start out by first looking at what exactly it is that the opposing side is doing. So first I start out by just looking at a lot of different examples of the argument being made. And then from there, I go into researching specific components of the arguments. Now, this particular one, it's a very narrow argument. So it really comes down to just asking the right questions. If you want to research any subject, you really just have to ask the right questions when you're doing it. Now, this particular one, it's pretty easy. You just type in like 18 year pause in global warming. You know, what are the facts debunked, whatever. And you just you just go from there and you just kind of branch out as you start asking more questions and so forth. This particular claim, it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's actually based upon faulty data. This is something that climate change deniers, even to this day, they'll still make this point, even though the data, several years ago, the data was revised by the organization that presented the data. Basically, the problem with this argument is that it was primarily based upon satellite data that was biased because these satellites, they're subject to orbital drift. So over time, as they drift and move from their original position, their temperature readings no longer are quite as accurate. That's because they're recording at different times. Uh, I think that's the main reason. Yeah. And basically the organization that put out this temperature data revised the data and they later came back and said, no, here is actually the correct data when you account for these different forms of bias. And, and so people are basically citing inaccurate data when they make this point. Also, even if it was accurate, even if we had an 18 year period where there was just like a flat line in, uh, temperatures, that doesn't necessarily mean that over the yep. long term, global warming isn't happening because yeah. this is a long term trend that we're talking yeah, about. Exactly. So to look at to look at short term trends like this and say uh, we can reach a general conclusion about the long term trend, it just doesn't strike me as uh, very reasonable. Yeah, for sure. And um, that whole uh, that whole meme between, um, you know, weather and climate, I feel like people don't actually understand the significant difference in those two terms, because weather, of course, is subject to a lot of different things, you know, solar radiation, meteorological changes, uh, how, um, you know, uh, cold snaps and hot snaps. Um, changes the barometric pressure, uh, perhaps, you know, the polar vortex that I just saw in Chicago is actually a result of ice breaking off in the northern shelf. Like there are just so many things that go into weather that you can't really obviously you can see the effects of climate disparately from weather. But of course, climate is the accumulation of all of those weather trends. And the people don't understand is climate essentially is an average it is an average of all of the weather events that have happened over a long period of time so obviously a really hot day could be evidence of global warming but you don't look at that one hot day you look at the exactly. average over a long long period of time and the fact that people are so bent on preaching this narrative of oh we had a really really cold day today so therefore climate change is real right it, like it, it is so it goes beyond. So in the scientific community, when you call something not even wrong, that is the most offensive thing you can say to a scientist, <laughs> because it's not like you're just wrong. And like your, your premise is correct, but your interpretation is wrong. You are not right. even in the realm of possibility to be called wrong. Like and and those people who preach that narrative oh, what we hasn't hasn't warmed in 18 years. It was really, really cold today. So therefore, climate change is real, like our president said over a stupid tweet a couple of days ago. Um that shit is just not even wrong. It's it, you like you. It's not debatable. Like and and the fact that they 
couch that as being apt to enter political discourse with people who actually contribute to the data is just foolish. And, and so one one argument that really grinds my gears is so when people talk about the amount of carbon that humans have deliberately or not deliberately, but like have have by as a byproduct of industrialization emitted in the atmosphere. Of course, there is more CO2 in the atmosphere because of natural forces. That's called the carbon cycle, of course. And people say sure. that, oh, human beings contribute a very small amount. So therefore, natural causes are more uh, more devastating than, than human causes. So therefore, climate change is bullshit and it's nothing to do with humans. And people don't understand that there is a maximal carbon balance in the atmosphere that is in tune with one another, with the seas, with the skies, with eruptions from volcanic ash and it, it, this is the analogy I always give. Imagine you have a bucket hanging off of a string and it can handle 55 pounds of weight. You throw in five pounds of extra weight and the bucket, you know, snaps off the rope and it falls. And it's like, what the fuck? This is like 10% of what you're actually carrying. Like, how can you not hold this much? But you're putting it over a certain point to which it can actually maximally handle that weight. And the same thing is true with the carbon balance. Of course, what we've put in is kind of small, but when you have gigatons more of what it can actually maximally handle, of course the carbon balance can be out of whack and all that accumulated carbon dioxide and other anthropogenic pollutants like sulfur and nitrogen, which is what I study, all of those things are chilling in the atmosphere because they can't be absorbed by the natural balance of carbon and things. So... Yeah, that really pisses me off when people misconstrue that data. <laughs> you know, I don't even know if I would agree with your framing that we're putting a small amount into the atmosphere. Well, no, if you, if you, in if relation you to at, everything, yeah. In relation well, to Well, sure. It, yeah. Okay. But, I mean, you know, we're putting out just millions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So uh, I don't know if I would necessarily agree. I mean, I, I haven't studied the exact numbers in this, but I, I just know that we're putting out enormous amounts of greenhouse gases into the oh. atmosphere. So when people oh, yeah, say sure, things yeah. like, how could humans impact the atmosphere when our planet is so big? It's like, dude, we have millions of cars on the road. We have all these factories. We have all this agriculture. So, you know, even even though individually, yeah, humans are small, collectively yeah. as a society with 7 billion of us, we're contributing enormous amounts into the atmosphere. No, no, and that's what I was actually going to get my point to. Like, trust me, we don't have a disagreement because I was dude. saying the lifetime of any kind of insulative gas emission over the entire period of the earth existing versus what humans have contributed. Obviously there are more sources of carbon that have globally and therefore lifetime uh, wise been accreted in the atmosphere, but the rate at which they've been emitted is astronomically larger than they ever have been before, which is because of humans. So like, even though right. that what we've contributed is small in relation to the overall carbon of the atmosphere, the rate at which it's being emitted is just why is there a, you have a I don't know what the <laughs> fuck I'm trying to go full screen here and it's like putting hard I just love your argument that much that's I was signaling that to you no I'm trying to figure out how to go full screen and it's like doing some weird shit on me here uh, I, I was like damn you, you throw me like likes like a like a super chat or something yeah damn. yeah exactly but um, I don't know I, I don't I don't use Skype very often so we'll, we'll keep going we'll pretend like that's right, we'll, we'll keep going. yeah whatever we'll, we'll just you know we'll, we'll we'll brush that one off um but yeah like uh even though over the lifetime of all carbon in the atmosphere what we contributed is is I say small, I mean, it's it's lesser than what has been in the atmosphere before, but because of the rate of emission is so much larger. I mean, if you if you graph man made carbon or even just carbon in general, we've stayed roughly at a steady incline until humans had the Industrial Revolution, of course, and then it just skyrockets. And the fact that people try and say the hockey stick graph is a farce, which I agree, there have been some hyperbolic claims about climate change. But the but the fact that you're able to say that carbon is at you know a a comparable intensity of emission than it was in the past is just foolish and so um yeah it, it, it's 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 triggering beyond no end because people who are not actually equipped to study the data or even contribute to it are having a subjective opinion and so one thing that i always say to people when i debate climate change is you can have subjective opinion of the data but the, pr the prerequisite for that is being an objective scientist. Like you cannot, you cannot enter an objective field with a subjective opinion without being an objective scientist in that field. Like I would never ever comment on biology unless I was actually versed in the literature and versed in the actual study of that. And the same thing goes for climate change. People have these flippant opinions about, you know, random cherry pick stats, like, like, a, like ellipsoidal orbits of the sun, which makes no sense. Like it, it's, it, it's, it's something that we see, especially in climate change, but in really all political discourse where people enter into discourse that aren't 
equipped to do so. And, and in my in my experience, like like you said earlier, you can have the best argument of all time, even without an educational background. But to comment on science and data collection, you do need, in my opinion, a, a more objective training in that field. Yeah, I don't think you necessarily need to be an expert, but at least like study the science, you know, exactly. read some textbooks on the subject just, and just educate yourself before you just regurgitate Republican talking points. Because it, it's it's almost a bit baffling to me how it's so sharply uh, divided on partisan lines. You know, you'd think people would just be coming to their own conclusions, but really they just fall into their partisan camps. And it's very strange to me to see that you have right wingers almost uniformly that probably the majority of right wingers, I don't know the exact statistics, but probably the majority are climate change deniers of one sort or another. Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's funny when you hear Republicans say things like, oh, climate change has become politicized, when really, if you think about it, this is something that they are responsible for, because they are they are the ones who, they're a part of this political group that just repeats these same anti-climate change talking points. And a point that I often like to make is that whenever you hear a conservative say, the science on climate has become politicized, translate that in your head to... Uh, conservatives reject the scientific findings and the scientific consensus on the subject, because that's really what they mean when they say that. Exactly. And, and also, I mean, like, uh, like we said before, like, you know, you can you can be educated in the subject and actually have a subjective opinion after you've versed yourself in the data. But how can you then say that a scientific consensus is therefore invalid? Because let's say 5% of uh, climate change scientists are bought by you know, the big oil industries. Like, uh, I think uh, William Tapper is one of them. That's just a complete hack. Um, he was like somebody who was kind of disgraced in the atmospheric community. And then he basically took a bunch of money from Exxon Mobil and stuff. And actually, there was yeah, a really soon. Yeah. Yeah, really Valley, soon. Yes, there, there yeah. Are some other ones. <laughs> yeah, but like there are people who will literally say, "Give me two hundred bucks an hour, and I will generate any fucking study you want to say and whatever data you want." And see, uh, there, yeah. I think there is a second option that we need to consider, though, is it could be that these people are getting paid to say these things. But another alternative is that the climate, uh, that the the oil industry, they simply identify people that already hold these views and they fund their research. So I, I don't yeah. think it's necessarily the case that they're simply being paid to lie to the public knowingly. It could just be that the oil industry is funding people who they found exactly. agree with them. Yeah, for sure. Even like in a tepid way. I mean, if, if you already have the, bre- the, the, the premise kind of baked into your mind with more money, I mean, obviously you'll preach that thing, you know, to the cows come home, of course, even right. if you only agree with it tepidly to begin with. But you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very glad that we didn't, uh, you know, have to quarrel about scientific data because that's something that really triggers the ever living fuck out of me when people like talk about climate change. And there was a guy uh, on fuck, I, I forget who it was. It was on Facebook at some point. But uh, he was saying that, like, you know, you can have an objective opinion about things, uh, even though you're not versed in the, the field like we've already agreed about. And he said, you ever heard of uh, what's the guy who made continued fractions? Uh, Sr- uh, Srinyasa Radaman, I think his name was the guy who like basically theorized continued fractions fractions he was like a mathematical prodigy but basically like i'm not sure yeah but basically like the whole mean he was making was from a simple textbook in third world i think i think it was india way back in the day he was able to extrapolate theorems that have baffled mathematicians for years but mm. that's symbolic logic like <laughs> that's not like a, a thing that is based on empirical data mathematics right. is Obviously, we found in science that mathematics perfectly demonstrates the nature in which uh, things interact with each other, like physics and engineering and and astrophysics and stuff. But that is a somewhat a subjective medium because we've actually imparted symbols onto things and we projected meaning onto those symbols. And so you can't relate a mathematician to something like climate change because climate change or just climate science generally is based on empirical observations of data that have been taken over many many years and so people will cite that where it's like these people had you know uh had a genius breakthrough in this field why can't you know laymen actually contribute their opinion to the climate change uh climate change skeptics and stuff and yeah that's just like, like that's I, I, it's a logical fallacy on like 15 different ways it, it yeah it pisses me off <laughs> I was hoping I, I kind of wanted to return to a climate change argu- a climate change denier argument that you briefly brought up earlier. I think I think it's worth going into a little more detail Let's because it. yeah, sure. it, it's one it's one that I can understand why some people would be prone to uh, believing it. It's it's the argument that uh, if you have some sort of record setting cold day, cold weather events, you know, like uh, record cold temperatures, record snowfall or whatever, people might see that and think if global warming is occurring, 
uh, why are we seeing record setting cold temperatures? This is, you know, sometimes the argument isn't made that eloquently. Sometimes they'll just say things like it's cold outside. Therefore, global warming is a hoax. Like, a Jim, you know, Senator, like Jim Inhofe, right? Exactly. With the snowball, yeah. yeah. yeah he, <laughs> Senator James Inhofe, for, for those of you who aren't aware, he famously brought a snowball into uh, the Senate. Dude, and he gave he a speech. Used a he used a picture he, of a he, snowman he, behind him. Uh, like his family made like a big snowman. Really? In his <laughs> Seriously, look, look at his video. It's, it's unbelievable. It's oh, ridiculous. But, but like, go on, yeah. You know, it, it would be one thing if this was some sort of redneck at a sports bar who's like, you know, I scraped some ice off my window shield and that means global you know it, it would be one thing if this was just like yeah. some dumb fuck at a bar or whatever this but guy, these are these are our higher high our <laughs> highest elected officials making these arguments and it's, it's just oh, like man. the most basic scientific ignorance you know a cold day a cold weather event that doesn't disprove a long-term trend that gets back to what we were talking about earlier it's an average, if you have yeah. especially if it's localized too like uh i think it was last new year's eve uh, the northeastern United States had exceptionally cold temperatures, record-setting cold, and okay, that's just one part of the planet. Exactly. You know, it's a very large planet. So even on that particular day, if you looked at the rest of the world, the rest of the world was uh, I'm pretty sure it was hotter than the average. So you you have to look at the entire globe collectively and not just these localized geographical areas. And you also have yeah. to look at the at the time scale broadened out. You can't just cherry pick individual incidents like this. And it, it's like, okay, you're going to have some record setting cold events in any given year, but you're going to have way more record setting hot ones. And that's the other side of the equation that climate change deniers never draw attention to. They'll tweet when it's cold outside but when it's when it's there's like a record setting hot events uh they never have anything to say about it so it, it, it's it's just a uh, selection bias i guess is what it is they're only looking at one side of it yeah and it's also kind of a confirmation bias where like they'll bake in their own premise into their mind and then work backwards from a conclusion that actually fits their narrative which is just so weird because I, like you know like I'm of the I'm of the impression that people who are rational should, should start tabula rasa. People who like Rousseau and Jefferson and stuff. Like people start as a blank slate, and you should actually ascertain data about the world and and you know make, basically make your premises from that or, or your conclusions from those premises. You should never start with a conclusion that you believe and then try and post hoc rationalize what you've exactly. already concluded. Because like I, I can't even get into how fuck that is because like imagine like if you were born saying you know uh this certain politician is awesome without actually learning what he said off the record or on the record and so then you actually look and cherry pick for things that he's done that are good that support your narrative that he's great but then you ignore all the other stuff it's terrible and so that's just a terrible way to look at the world because you don't really actually arrive at any deeper truth all you do is just try and confirm your own confirm your own biases um, and also, so something you talk about with climate change uh, that really triggers me is um, people will always cite big snowfalls as, uh, you know, evidence for, you know, oh, global warming is bullshit. Climate change is bullshit. There's no hot on average, you know, temperature rise throughout the years. Like people don't understand that winter follows summer and the warm water has to go somewhere at some point. There's a thing called vaporization that happens when water is heated, it gets turned into the gas, and then it goes into the atmosphere. What happens in the atmosphere, water condenses, and it has to go somewhere. And then based on the meteorological trends of that time where it's vaporized, that will do different things. It could become a tsunami. It could become a hurricane. It could become a snowfall. And so, like, the fact that people aren't able to discern the subtle balance between weather and climate I think it's just the biggest problem because until we actually get on a cogent way of looking at the world, we're never going to be in the same chain of reality as people that say a snowball is a reason why climate change is bullshit. Like it, it, it's never going to happen unless like the public actually is educated, which it sounds pretentious to say, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, you also hinted at something very important and that's that many of these cold weather events are actually linked, linked to, to global like warming. It seems, it seems, yep. Yeah, it's, it seems it seems paradoxical. You're like, if the planet is warming, why would we see, you know, record setting snowfall events? But, uh, you know, there are mechanisms that actually link the processes together. Yep. Like with, with s certain snowfall events like nor'easters, for example, the increased evaporation of water from the warming of the oceans can actually lead to heavy snowfall elsewhere. So so that's just one mechanism where uh, the warming is actually connected to these events. It, it's a little confusing, but if you look into it, uh, you know, it, it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And like uh, with the polar vortex, there is this whole thing that's happening with like, you know, ice shelves breaking off and basically causing almost a snap of cold water to be injected. And therefore it's, you know, I, I, I mean, not, not cold water, cold air rather. Sorry. Um, but yeah, it, it's the subtle balance between, um, 
uh, understanding the warming of, you know, the entire globe, not just one pinpointed hemisphere in the globe, but the globe and then the implications for, you know, the water cycle or uh, vaporization of seawater. And and, and one thing uh, that really pisses me off is people cite the fact that the ocean water is only going to raise one degree if we do nothing. And my head, you know, erupts in flames because people don't understand the earth is 68 percent water do you know how much energy it takes to warm the entire the, the entirety of bodies of water on the globe by one degree that is that is so much thermal energy it's actually it's it's like almost incalculable it's like yeah. that, that like like the specific i don't want to get into chemistry but like the specific heat capacity of water is such that to warm all of the water on the globe is an absurd amount of energy. And when people say, you know, it's only one degree. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Maybe easier to swim in summertime for sure. Or in the wintertime, maybe. But um, yeah, that, that just that proves there's just such a, a logical farce that's happening with the climate change debate. It's it, it's really stunning. <laughs> well, and it's not it's not just the actual temperature raising itself that we have to worry about in the oceans. It's also the absorption of carbon dioxide. Exactly. Into the oceans. Yeah. Yeah, because what happens is when more CO2 enters the oceans, it reacts with uh, certain carbonic chemicals. Acid. I can't, I, yeah. I can't remember acid, the exact yeah. reaction, but yeah, it yeah. forms carbonic acid, which ultimately uh, makes the pH of the oceans more acidic. This yeah. causes coral bleaching. This has all kinds of devastating impacts on exactly. coral reefs and other oceanic uh, environments. Like, you know, these are really rich hotspots of diversity. And if you if you kill the corals, then that's just the bedrock of the ecosystem that dies out. And this isn't something that just happens like in, you know, one little pattern of coral reef here and there. Uh, this is something that's happening increasingly in more places around the globe. And the predictions for coral bleaching, these are extremely dire. Oh, yeah. uh, I can't remember the exact statistics, but if you just, if you look at maps of like coral bleaching predictions, models, and so forth, you see that by, by the 2050s, we have something like 70, 80% of all coral reefs uh, across the planet having level two bleaching events, which is where there's significant mortality of corals. So this has all kinds of, it's not like just the corals are affected, but the entire ecosystem suffers as a result of this. 2050s, that's like 30 years from now. You exactly. know, This is something we don't have a lot of time to deal with. And people treat it as if it's like, oh, whatever, you know, a couple hundred years from now, there might be some issues. No, no this is happening now. And it, people just, uh, many people just don't understand the urgency of uh, this problem. Exactly. There are so many problems that I feel like people aren't even aware of, um, you know, like uh, the acidification debate. I mean, obviously, like, you know, I'm a chemist, so I understand all the chemistry that happens when carbonic gas is released into the water and stuff. But like, people Could you explain that reaction a little bit. So essentially what happens is carbonic acid is created, which is H2CO3. And then basically when the conjugate acid, when the conjugate base of that, which is carbonate, reacts with that, there is just a prop. There's a propagation of more and more acidic or protic. Um, hydrogens that are in the water and so as you increase more and more carbonic acid you're releasing more and more acidic species into the water which lowers the overall ph of the entire system and then that manifests in things like we're going to see dead fish we're going to see uh, coral bleach we're going to see um sea organisms that are completely uh, eradicated and so like uh, uh, people don't even like approach this thing from the actual practical implications of those reactions or, or just the practical implications of what happens when things get hotter or colder. And um, yeah, man, I mean, uh, we, we can, we can blow it all we want, but this is a huge problem that I, I don't think many people actually even are equipped to understand, which is just, yeah, kind of a lot shitty. of people, I think a lot of people do oversimplify uh, when they talk about this, they view it really narrowly in terms of like the oceans getting warmer, uh, sea levels raising. Obviously, there's a lot more to it. You know, and just just one more uh, negative impact I think worth mentioning while we're on the subject is uh, not only are coral reefs affected, but also organisms that uh, build shells and they use uh, I think it's uh, carbonate from the ocean to build yes. their shells. I might be wrong about the specific molecule, but basically organisms in the ocean that uh, create shells, when the ocean becomes more acidic, their shells are a lot weaker. Uh, you know, they have like holes in them. They're not nearly as strong and firm and protective. So th this is uh, just another area where uh, the biological health of uh, the ocean gets negatively impacted when you increase the CO2 levels. Obviously, it's connected to the temperatures, but it's a separate thing that that uh, it's definitely worth talking about because, like I said, it's it's very urgent. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, 
Yeah, it's very refreshing to actually have political discourse with somebody that actually understands, uh, you know, science and, and climate change data and stuff. So that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a refreshing change of place for me because uh, I, I get in some pretty viscerally charged debates with people that aren't really actually like even not even like they're not even equipped. They're just they're not really interested in even engaging in the data. All they want to do is just confirm their own bias. And that's that at the end of the day, you never convince people like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I also think just generally, I feel like this. This this kind of anti-intellectualism that's kind of been, you know, shown, it's always been apparent in society, but especially recently with the whole climate change debate, there isn't there's such a, a, a blissful amount of ignorance in people where at the end of the day, they're not even really trying to understand what you actually mean by a scientific consensus or a theory like a scientific consensus. People couch it as a political word. They say, oh, it's a consensus. That means that, like, you know, they met in the back room and they um, agree that this is the premise. No, <laughs> right. a scientific consensus means means that essentially for layman watching if you do an experiment 200 times and then 199 times of that you get the exact same result that means roughly you have a 99.2 percent chance of that thing being constant in a system right and then theory people use the term theory as kind of a pejorative in a way where it's like oh right. it's just a theory it's it's uh -huh. you know the people are theorizing no a theory is a is a very well tested hypothesis, and that's an emphasis on well tested because well tested means that throughout many 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 specific political avenues and scientific avenues, you have approached the uh, the problem from any way you see fit, and then you arrive at the same conclusion. That's what a theory is, and especially when it relates to climate change. So many different scientists, not just climatologists, are actually exhibiting the things that we see as dangers because of climate change and this ocean acidification and um, over temperature rise, like. Like, for example, like radiative scientists, people just do uh, spectroscopy, marine biologists, ecologists, all of these people are promulgating the exact same narrative that climate change is dire, it's real, and it's largely man-made, and we have to stop it. Now, and, and it's just very strange to me that we can arrive at the exact same conclusion over multiple fields of study and multiple avenues of investigation, and people still call it the fact that the people who study the data are politicized. It's just a, it's a really strange hypocrisy that um, I think needs to be stopped. This anti intellectualism needs to be stopped immediately. Otherwise, we're going to see a lot of terrible impacts, not just in climate change, but in overall just political discourse, really. It, you know, what's interesting is you don't really hear that kind of argument made in other areas. You know, people accuse climate scientists of fudging the data. It's a conspiracy to give the gov more, government more power, to get them lucrative research grants, because, you know, uh, Trust me, dude, scientists dude, are just notoriously wealthy. Dude, like, I'm a PhD student and we get a stipend. Um, I guarantee you, they're not really funding my big money. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, funded, funded like, by small money. Dude, like scientific grants are not these lucrative things. Like, and right. most of the money that you get goes to materials for your research. You're not like you're not pocketing like a hundred thousand bucks or anything. Like flying on private jets and stuff, no, laughing I, all the way to the bank. Dude, I think the average fucking stipend for a PhD student, really just like a field scientist, is like twenty eight grand. Like that's right. like. That's like barely a living wage. <laughs> like, if you actually yeah, look at the data, it, it, they frame they frame it as if that's like enough to corrupt them. It's like twenty eight thousand. Yeah, dude, dude, and and it's so shitty because like obviously obviously I'm not a fucking conspiracy theorist. I'm not trying to like you know fudge the data and push a political narrative. The hey, only that's reason exact, that's exactly what you would say if you were. So <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> okay, but dude. You, you can't meme me like that because that's an actual argument that's been used against me where it's like, it's yeah. like oh of course you'd say that i'm like oh i got it but no, no but yeah. back to what i was saying though is uh I, I do think it's interesting that you hear that accusation made against people who study climate science but you rarely hear it made against people who study like agriculture oh you're you're just you know producing these findings so you can get more government funding so you yeah. don't hear it made against geologists or people who study uh you know biodiversity it, it's just like it's for some reason it's only leveled at climate scientists and uh i think that's kind of strange yeah well i mean there's also a lot of things going on there because like climate change uh related policies um i feel like they're the only ones in terms of the scientific community that would actually stifle some degree of capitalism or basically it will uh stifle some kind of uh, monopoly or even just some kind of like um, amount that we're actually emitting the atmosphere through uh fossil fuels or car emissions or anything like that um, so I, I think that's also one aspect of it. But also, I mean, it, 
it, it's something that is so easily disprovable in people's minds. Like, oh, it's, you know, it's climate change. But, you know, I don't feel the climate changing. It's not that hot today. It's not that cold today. It's too hot today. Like, it's something that is so keen to be subjective because weather is something that we experience on a second to second basis. But people don't understand the distinction between weather and climate, which I think it's just, it, it, there's a lot of different factors as to why the, this has become such a politicized issue um, for people that actually don't understand the data. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I really, aside from doing this, like us trying to preach the fact that scientific data is something that should be lauded and should be actually adhered to, I don't know what people are going to actually do to kind of combat this faux intellectualism, because if we don't, like I said, political discourse and really just scientific interpretation of data is kind of doomed in the, you know, the populace. You know, Ralph Nader has a, he has a really interesting approach to raising awareness of this issue. And he doesn't like the term climate change because he thinks it's too benign and yeah. kind of neutral sounding. And he prefers using alternative terms like climate disruption or even climate devastation. So I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on that approach? I think actually I was going to bring that up. I, I think that like uh, changing the changing the terminology would be great. I, I think climate perturbation is probably a pretty decent term because we're actually imparting an external stimulus onto the climate system. So I think that climate perturbation or climate disruption will be great. I mean, um, I, I think that actually it will more accurately portray the issues with uh, with you know climate actually changing. So I think that terminology change would be good um, because I mean, of course, we've seen the fact that you know a terminology change in the positive direction you know is terrible for discourse we started with global warming and then when people said oh it hasn't warmed for a couple years so i guess it's called climate change now which of course like it sounds more benign but really there are the exact same conclusions just framed differently so i feel like yeah, if exactly. people are more forceful with their actual and this is something in science that really pisses me but not it doesn't piss me off it, it, it's it's good as an objective science to do this but because if you ask an, a, a perfectly objective scientist if i'm going to jump off this roof will i fly it, a truly objective scientist should say to be you know, completely scientifically correct. I am as mathematically certain as I possibly can be that you will not fly if you jump off there. <laughs> but for other people, that leaves a little bit of like, like chance that of course, well, you know, maybe he's wrong. Maybe I can fly. And so like, I feel like scientists avoid being overly declarative in their language because of that, because they want to be as objectively grammatically correct as they possibly right. can. But when something has been this blown out of proportion with memes, I think that really people really should start to be a little more forceful with the terminology if that makes any sense yeah you know i'm just anticipating counter arguments where somebody would be like oh the term climate devastation it's it's way too it's way too much of climate change alarmism my response to whenever people talk about climate change alarmism is yeah we should be alarmed <laughs> we should be very <laughs> deeply alarmed by what's happening here you know, like how are <laughs> Yeah, how are you going to look at all of the implications of global warming and all of the negative impacts this is going to have and just be like, oh, well, that's very interesting and we should have a – no, you should be like – you should be shitting in your pants on a <laughs> daily basis when you think about the subject. So it's it's just a weird term to me, like how it's used as a smear to say that you're alarmed about something that's alarming. Do like you're preaching the choir, man, because honestly, like and it's like you said, um, like 25 minutes ago or so, it's like people view this as like a tepid problem that, oh, yeah, we might see a couple, you know, more precipitous hurricanes or anything like that. But, you know, it's not going to be like a huge issue and like you know, until after we're all gone. And I'm like, how how apathetic do you have to be about the world to view anything with that kind of lens we're like oh well it's not gonna be a problem for me so fuck it how selfish and how self-aggrandizing do you have to be because if you and this is what really pisses me off if you're a conservative you should conserve things right 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 in your name right terminology says conserve <laughs> things make sure everything is as compact and as non-changing as possible what is a bigger factor to conserve other than the planet that you actually live on because if the planet doesn't exist your beautiful capitalism your beautiful small businesses and your beautiful tax breaks won't exist so like like it's just strange how like people that are are, are preaching this conservatism ideology completely throw it out the door when it doesn't suit their own political narratives it's just it, it, it's 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 I mean, it, it's terrible it really is yeah that's, it, that's a very interesting point yeah, it, it, it there is just uh, trust me, I, I've I've had 
I've had more conversations fuck two ways a Saturday um, about climate change that literally I've had to like come up with like the weirdest premises and analogies to try and get through to people. But literally people are just cemented in their ideologies. They, they just don't get it. And so um, what's what's the craziest argument you've heard from a climate change denier? What's the one that made just like gave you the most pause where you were like, that's so stupid. I can't even process it. It's snowing. It's snowing. Yeah, that's like, got to be up there. Oh, like there was honestly so much wrong with that. I literally, could, I, I literally couldn't even progress the conversation any further. I literally couldn't. And like, Oh my God. Like, because like, okay, let's say like they, they brought in like some random ass like study where it's like, you know, Oh, the precipitous hurricanes are not as precipitous or something like that. Something like super propaganda esque. at least they've made the effort to actually investigate the issue. They just right. looked at a lot of shitty sources, which, okay, like terrible sources. And you're a fucking idiot for looking at those things. But at least I can respect you for actually taking it upon yourself as a third party to look at the data. If you just look out your window and say it's snowing and that's proof enough for you, I got no patience for that shit, man. I really can't. <laughs> I, I can't do it. <laughs> did you uh, Did you see Candace Owens' appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast? Oh, man. I... <laughs> like... Dude, that was something else, wasn't it? Oh, my God. Like, uh, first, her, her original premise is where it's like, the fact that there is disparity in the scientific community is enough to say that it's not true. And like, yeah, it's a very small disparity. It, it's not even small. It's minuscule. It's like, like, and if you take out all the people that have been disgraced in their fields, like it gets even more than 99.6% of peer reviewed journals that have been released, uh, peer reviewed uh, articles and journals that have been released support anthropogenic climate change as a dire threat. And so like the fact that you're like doing this, like this pseudo nuance pickling where like you're saying, oh yeah, of course, like there's disparity. So therefore it's debatable. It, and this is something that actually I wanted to bring up to you where people yeah. use any kind of disparity and a topic as, you know, grounds for entering a debate about it. Like to right. me, climate change is not a debatable issue. It really is not. Um, if you look at any kind of scientific jargon or any kind of scientific data, you would understand that it's a it's pretty much a signed and sealed delivered issue. But people use, you know, two percent error, three percent error as grounds for believing the entire thing is bullshit. Like, OK, of course, there were declarative statements that were used in, you know, inconvenient truth, for example. Right. But people think that plus or minus 10 percent of error is equivalent to plus or minus 200 percent of error. And so. Yeah, man, like a like a th th this whole present this whole like presentation of the debate as a 50 50 topic is so it it's such a farce because if CNN actually wanted to portray climate change debate in an objective way, they would have 25 climate change scientists that are saying this is real and this is dire threat. And they'd have one person to defend off all those people, because that is what the actual balance of the scientific data does. And to to to, you know, have this kind of neutrality bias where you're presenting the issue as a 50 50 thing is actually harmful for political discourse. It's not an objective analysis anymore. It's it's just you're trying to ride the line as much as you can and not present one side favorably or not. And so to say 50 50 side, you present one guy talking for three minutes, the other guy talking for three minutes and they duke it out. That's not how the debate should actually work if you're presenting the data and the objective reality of the situation actually in line with reality, I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I don't know if you heard, but I think it was NBC recently had an, a whole hour long special dedicated to climate change. And right at the outset, they were like, we're not going to involve any climate change deniers because the science is settled and there's no Thank value you. in doing that. And conservatives and climate change deniers were shitting their pants about this. They were outraged that I read one op-ed in Fox News where this guy made a ludicrous comparison where he, he was like, oh, if this is like uh, if Galileo was around today, he would be he would be suppressed. <laughs> Dude, where he was where, he one. was comparing he was comparing climate change <laughs> denialism to uh, no, I think he said Copernicus was uh, was the person he, That's he the so one. he was he was comparing one. denying climate change to uh, geocentrism. It's like no, you, you have it completely backwards. Like Dude. he was fr he was framing oh. the unscientific position as as the one that's the correct scientific position, and he was like, oh, we're being martyred like Copernicus was. It was it was just ridiculous to read. Yes, like. <sighs> Oh my God, dude! I forgot someone fucking used that in debate with me too. The Copernicus thing, where, really? like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, like you think Copernicus went against the scientific orthodoxy when he was around? Of course he did. That's why we have you know the heliocentric model now. And I'm like, dude, you realize you just proved my point for me, right? <laughs> like, 
Well, also, I mean, <sighs> like, what conclusions people were reaching, you know, 300 years ago, it's totally different from something that we've been studying for exactly. decades. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it's like, imagine that we discover tomorrow that DNA plays absolutely no role in evolution. It's just completely inconceivable given the mountains of evidence there are supporting the role of DNA in biology. It's similar to the consensus in climate climate change. Like there's virtually no way we're going to come out tomorrow and discover, oh, actually greenhouse gas emissions, it's they awesome. don't cause yeah. the temperature to rise, you know? So like theoretically, yes, we should always be open to revisions in our viewpoints and we should always be open to the possibility that scientific ideas can be overturned. But at the end, like you reach a point where we know so much about a subject that just practically speaking, there's virtually a zero chance that that's going to happen. Yeah, for sure. And like, um, yeah, that kind of goes on the point where it's like the tools at our disposal now are just so much more sophisticated and so much more apt to actually have scientific data truly mean something. Of course, like they had abacuses and shit and they had, you know, different magnifying glass and telescopic right. lenses and stuff. But like, the precision and the error associated with those things is like you can't even compare something like a, a geothermal satellite uh, react of data and temperatures in the atmosphere versus that. Like you just can't. Exactly. And like that goes in the kind of like the whole, you know, deism versus, you know, uh, I, I forget what the term was back then about like uh, what, what, what was the, it was the whatever centric model when like the sun was like a was was just like a like a force in the atmosphere and like the earth was the. Uh, the center. I, I forget what that entire geocentrism model was versus yeah, geocentrism. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, 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 that's what it was called. Yeah, I forgot the other term for it. But um, but yeah, um, I just hope that we can actually shed this uh, this faux intellectualism that's coming up from mostly the far right for climate change. I mean, there are some idiot lefties that say that it's not true, but um, the the balance is actually tipped uh, favorably in the left's position for that for that uh, subject for sure. Um, yeah, man. Um as a person who's actually contributing to the data and stuff, it really triggers me beyond no end that people actually will couch his arguments and think that they've actually, Oh, I own them. Like, you know, idiots. Like, yeah, it's just, it's terrible. Um, well, Hey, I was, I was wondering if you wanted to move on to another subject. Yeah, no, I, I was about to move on. Yeah, for sure. All right. So we talked about, um, this kind of faux centrism a little bit, um, with, uh, you know, the CNN climate change kind of thing where people present both sides as equally valid. Um, it's interesting to me because this, this flow centrism and kind of pseudo intellectualism, it's seen as like a very rational and level headed response to people that actually don't engage in political discourse. And so I think a perfect example of that is, uh, Dave Rubin. So Dave Rubin is everyone who probably, you know, uh, I, I have, I have a decent amount of political fans that are in the audience, uh, cause I, you know, was in some political circles on YouTube before I started my channel, but, um, Basically, he's a guy who's in the Young Turks, and essentially, he's become just kind of a... It's not even like a spokesperson. He's almost like a mouthpiece. And, like, he doesn't ever, never really has any, like, original ideas for himself. But basically, he invites people on a show that say things that are wildly deceptive or, at the very best, very, you know, strange. And will just never challenge him in anything. And so, because he's... He's framing it as he's not doing this to play point counterpoint. He's doing it like he's just the guy who's asking questions. And right. so to he likes to liken himself to Larry King. Dude. Oh, man. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> yeah. But but dude, like he's he has this uh, this opinion of himself where like, you know, he believes that he is the one who's arriving at the greater truth because he's allowing people who have very, very strange opinions and stupid ideas about things just to come on to his show and just say whatever they want without really challenging them about anything. And um, that like it's just strange way of framing because he actually doesn't really arrive at any conclusions. All he's doing is saying, hey, I'm just a guy asking questions. And then because of that, he's able to skirt any kind of criticism saying that, oh, you just don't like other people's opinions. Or no, like you can have your own opinions and stuff. But if you're an actual objective person, you should actually challenge people when they say things that are, um, you know, deceptive or wrong or stupid. And he's somebody that just kind of masquerades himself as this faux centrist. Like he's a classical liberal, but he's, you know, very much in favor of gay marriage. He's, you know, he's married to a guy he says he's for universal health care but then he doesn't he's not in support of government subsidies but he also is he's a supportive of obamacare um he, he has just like wildly contradictory uh, positions but because he's just framing it as the guy asking questions he just kind of skirts all that criticism so what do you think of dave rubin that i've kind of talked about him like that 
Man, I have a lot to say about this guy. I've already made several videos critiquing his arguments and his style and so forth. There, uh, you know, I could I could talk all night about this guy. I would just say one thing in response to uh, what you just talked about. I don't I don't think it's a huge problem for somebody to have a style where they want to just have a guest on and just have the guest uh, present their views. If that if you want that to be the style of your program, okay, maybe it's not the way I would conduct myself in your position. But if that's the way he wants to do it, it's not something that particularly outrages me all that much. What bothers me about Dave Rubin's just general style on his channel is that he he often presents himself as just being sort of this neutral arbiter who will have guests from all across the political spectrum on. And, uh, you know, everyone's getting to share their views. So, you know, what's the big problem here? If you actually look at the lineup of guests that he's had, he's – uh. I, I haven't done like a rigorous statistical analysis of this, but just looking through the interviews that he's done, you see way more prominent right wingers, especially prominent uh, in the YouTube sphere, than oh, yeah. prominent left wingers. I could only find one progressive who I would consider like one of one of the the giants in the YouTube who was sphere. It? it was Jimmy Dore, and it was like three years ago, and they talked mostly Jimmy about Dore comedy. Won Dave Rubens, really? Like three years ago, and they and they talked oh, about stand up comedy sure. and stuff yeah. like that. So I mean, it, it wasn't even like a big. Uh, resounding defense of leftist policies. People like, you know, Cenk Uger, Anna Kasparian, Kyle Kalinske, David Pakman, many of the people who I consider some of the biggest names in progressive YouTube just haven't been on his program. And even when he does have uh, nominally left-wing guests on his program, oftentimes they spend uh, a considerable portion of their conversation bashing the left, bashing SJWs. It's not like he brings somebody on and they're forcefully defending left-wing views, but but they spend you know a good portion of the time attacking SJWs and outrage culture and things like that. So it it it, it kind of annoys me that he presents himself as if it's a balanced presentation of all views when not, really yeah. I think it's pretty clear that it's that it's an anti uh, left slanted channel. That's that's mainly what annoys me about uh, just his general presentation yeah for sure it's like faux centrism you're you're presenting yourself as middle of the road and having all these people on but really all you're doing is just like giving one side a mouthpiece and the other side you're just kind of bashing like and and this kind of brings in another thing so the 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 use of the term sjw or leftist as a pejorative has been incredibly effective for people that want to smear people that, dis that disagree with them like what's wrong with being an advocate for social justice tepidly nothing but if you attach the term SJW to it, it immediately confers a bunch of of terrible things. You know, a person who wants to shut down debate, a person that doesn't want to, you know, be disagreed with at all, a person that's going to scream on the on a countertop because Trump got elected and stuff. Right. And it's, yeah. And, and it just confers so many shitty things on people where that's how the entire left is viewed because they've just been using that over and over and over again as a pejorative. And I'm just curious, like, what do you think people can do to actually combat that? Because it's been so effective up till now. Well, number one, actually look at what it is that people on the left believe in. You yep. know, it's one thing to do what Dave Rubin does and just cherry pick isolated incidents. Oh, there was a Trigley Puff. You know, there was some sort of campus protest. It's one thing to just cherry pick isolated incidents of this that blew up on social media. Yeah. But how about you actually look at the polling data where people ask people on the left, what do you believe about these questions? Yeah. When you do this, what you find is that people on the left, a majority of people on the left are on the pro-free speech side of questions, whether yep. we're talking about uh, banning hate speech, whether we're talking about uh, banning offensive costumes on college campuses, whether we're talking about deplatforming people. If you actually conduct polling data of both adults and college students on the left, you find that a majority of them are on the pro-free speech side of these questions, which is something you never hear from the Ben Shapiro's and Dave Rubens of the world. Because I, I, I don't know if they don't know how to ascertain what it is that people believe by looking at polling data or if, or if they just don't care enough to actually look at what the data says. But that is, that's what you actually learn when you look at the polling data. And another interesting thing about the data is that – on the questions where a majority of people on the left are on the opposed to free speech side, a majority of Republicans are also on that side of the question. So it, it's not at all this right versus left divide where it's, you know, the conservatives are these stalwart defenders of freedom of expression and you have these these left wingers who want to ban uh, freedom of expression altogether. It's not at all the caricature that people like Dave Rubin presented as. And that's what they would learn if they actually looked at the polling data. I've never once heard Dave Rubin or Ben Shapiro cite 
polling information to substantiate their views on how the left is opposed to free speech or whatever it is, they always just cherry pick these isolated incidents that, that just catch fire on social media. And that's not how you learn about the world, you know, because a conversation where some college student is having a, a reasonable discussion about single payer health care, it's not going to blow up on social media like Triglypuff making a fool out of herself. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's the main way that you can combat it is by actually researching it in a rigorous way and not just talking out of your ass. Yeah, exactly. And and I think the problem with that is like people love to be agreed with. So it's like we talked about before. If people have a premise, they will use whatever kind of tools they have at the disposal to actually just confirm their own bias instead of actually looking at what is objectively true. And the perfect example of that is, um, you know, the people that you mentioned – Basically, like they don't look at statistical data or polling data to actually substantiate their claims. They say that, you know, basically data is the plural of anecdote, essentially is what they're arriving at. And that is just like, like no, like a couple YouTube videos of some blue haired people on Tumblr that are screaming about safe yeah. space and stuff that does not confer an ideology onto the, everybody that agrees with you that is more on the left side of the spectrum. And like the fact that they're using that as an actual <laughs> as an actual way of describing discourse in America, it just proves how fucking disingenuous some of those people are. And of course, there are there's a faction on the left that is troublesome or like identity politics is really the only thing they want to talk about. And like people that want to, you know, that the media and that smear bernie sanders and stuff like i'm just tired of old white men like go away right like shit yep. like that of course it's a problem but the majority of people on the left i would like you said i would venture to say that people actually are more of a laissez-faire in terms of free speech i think i, I feel that people actually are more live and let live than people like uh you know rubin or shapiro actually give them the credit for but because they're so sold on like selling this idea that um people on the left are completely rooted by emotion and feelings it doesn't really serve them well or even incentivize them to actually look at the data themselves and look at what's actually objectively true about it. So I totally agree with you where um, research is the only thing that's really going to solve that. But you have to actually not just be afraid of being proven wrong, but you actually have to impart it on yourself and take the effort to actually understand the other person's opinion as opposed to arguing in straw men, which I think is hard for people these days for sure. Yeah, and just be willing to accept that you're you were wrong about a question. Exactly. And revise your opinion accordingly. I would also add one thing about the general presentation that the Dave Rubens of the world uh, offer to us. And just think about what it is that they're doing. They're taking the most extreme and irrational minority within the left, and they're treating the left as a whole as if those people – sorry, just hit my mic here. It's fine. <laughs> they're treating it as if those – that extreme absurd minority are the best representatives of the left wing generally, which is just a fundamentally absurd uh, approach to – it's a fundamentally absurd method of talking about the question. Yeah, for sure, and like a – Honestly, I, I really wish that people on the left or people that, you know, agree with me, you and I on more of these issues uh, than the right wing. Like, um, I really wish that they were as loud and as boisterous as the people who like scream about safe spaces and, and identity and politics and trigger warnings and right. stuff. But of course, like I, I would venture to guess that people who you know believe the things that you and I believe are more rational, more level headed than that. But because people are so quick to to judge and to confer opinions on the people on the right side of the spectrum too, like people that scream about safe spaces will automatically assume that anybody who disagrees with them is a bigot and a racist. But the fact that the right wing is painting everybody on the left as that, as someone who's ready to call out someone for being a fascist and a Nazi without ever looking at what they actually have to say is just it's so it's so damaging for political discourse because it, it fuels their narrative of like feels versus reels, like for the left side of the spectrum where it's like, oh, they have the feels we have all the reels. And if you look at some of the spectra, if you look at some of the, the the spectral issues, like the left versus right, a lot of the issues in the right are based around rhetoric and how people feel about things, like everything with immigration, um, a lot of things with taxes too. Like uh, there's just a, there like a, uh, and, and let, let's go into this for a little bit. I think that rhetorically, the the more conservative libertarian side of things has such an advantage over people on the left, where rhetorically their ideas are are more resonant with people as opposed to people that have to defend left-wing ideas. Like, for example, taxes, for example, like marginal tax rates. The left side of the spectrum has an in-depth discussion on what the term marginal tax means and, like, looking at um, a data from, you know, the golden age of economic expansion and all these things that actually go into a very nuanced opinion. On the right side of the spectrum, it's your money. Keep it. Like that, that is succinct. That is, that is, is easy to understand and is easy to back up and defend. And like the, even though there are just so many different things that are wrong with that premise, like the whole taxation is theft meme, for example, like the rhetoric is so much easier to defend, which is just so crappy because even though that 
like a logical ideas may have a semblance of what is aligned with reality on the left, people on the right just have these rhetorically resonant talking points that really just don't really even say anything at the end of the day. Yeah, this is something David Pakman actually talks a lot about how the right wing is definitely winning the messaging war because they can they can package their ideas in these very succinct little catchphrases, almost like the sort of thing you would read read off a bumper sticker. You know, abortion so, so is murder. When did he talk about it? Actually, because I actually I, I was I was I was thinking this for a while and I actually haven't seen him talk about it. Do you know when he was you when know, he was discussing it? Yeah, you know, I don't I can't like point you to the, the title of a specific video, okay. but it's it's just generally a point he often makes cool. on his channel. But, yeah, go but, on. Sorry, go on. No, sure. But uh, so like an example of that is they'll say something like abortion is murder. The counter to that isn't, well, abortion is not murder. The counter is, well, it's complicated. You know, sometimes if the mother's health is threatened, then maybe it's reasonable that she could have an abortion. Or maybe if she's not in a condition to raise a child, there are other considerations. The, the response to that little three word catchphrase is something that's complicated and it requires you to go in detail and really hash it out. And that's how it is on a lot of uh, questions like another one, for example, the one that you gave, it's like it's it's your money versus, well, yes, it's your money, but we can use this money to benefit the people at large. And the more you earn, uh, maybe you should pay progressively more. It like it's simple messaging versus complex truths. And yeah. it's maybe maybe the solution to that is just for people on the left to get better at briefly packaging their eyes, their ideas together. But uh, it definitely makes the right wing position more attractive to low information voters, I think, where, where they can just throw these little slogans at them. And it's like, that's all I need to debate the conversation is just just this a really simple understanding of what the, the latest catchphrase is. Yeah. And that kind of goes along with a lot of the rhetoric that is used like an almost like a like a slanderous way. Like, for example, everyone called like, you know, Obama a communist and Obama a socialist when literally his policies are more right wing than a lot of democratic presidents so it's like right. like the fact that like people are, are so quick to smear that just kind of proves that messaging is really the key so um i, I think that yeah that, that's a really good point that you brought up where like i feel like packaging the point in something that could fit on a hat or a bumper sticker is something that really people on the left should really do like uh um, I mean, do you have any ideas for slogans for <laughs> the Democratic Party or just off uh, the top of my head? I can't really think of any good ones, but uh, it, it's also it's also not the kind of thing that I think we should be too quick to to call for. Like on the on the one hand, yes, it's important from a messaging perspective. But at the other like the other thing to consider is we don't necessarily want people to just have these superficial sure. surface level That's understandings true. of the questions. We want we want them to, to take a very close, thorough look at the question. So off the top of my head, I don't really have any good uh, like counter narratives to yeah. to combat this with. But but it, it's definitely something that I think we could benefit from, even while still advocating deeper research into oh, these oh, questions. Oh, 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 for sure. Like, I definitely and like as a person who is very analytical like I, I, i'm a scientist and so are you like i definitely value like you know uh you know objective and complicated truths over just like you know sounding off like some kind of like mouthpiece for whatever political right. ideology but like it just sucks because like a lot of people aren't like you and me and they don't want to actually look at the issues and so like you know how do we break through to that do we just have to you know hope that people actually get engaged at a certain point do we have to you know uh uh, we have to convince people that politics really is a dominant force in their lives and they should really understand these issues on an issue to issue basis. Like it, it, it's a strange problem. I mean, obviously we're not marketing people, so we're not going to like, you know, come sure. up with the, uh, come up with a solution here. But like, it, it's, it, it's, it's strange to think about because so much of political discourse is not really based on even the policies. And it, it's just, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how we're going to solve that for, uh, for actually communicating ideas effectively. Yeah, I think that's a question for uh, for wiser people that specialize in that area to uh, to answer. Yeah, for you wanna, sure. You want to shit on Dave Rubin some more? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, please. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, what are some other points I wanted to make about him? I have a couple of notes I wrote down dude, here. Oh, oh wait. So, did, dude, did you see um, his interview with David Pakman? Yeah, dude. I actually made a video <sighs> debunking some of it. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the stuff he talked about there. All right. Um, so, so, yeah, so, this, this was like <laughs> about a year ago. I, I think maybe even longer. But I think it was David July 2017, Pac I want to say, when he was on there. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was July or June, something like that. Yeah. Okay. David Pakman, he, he is a very tough interviewer. He asks very incisive questions, but he's also very polite when he does it. Yeah, exactly. If you watch that interview, Dave Rubin just crumbles. He looks visibly uncomfortable the whole time. You know, the, I mean – I can't read his mind, but just based off his body language, he's shifting around. He just, uh, he looks uh, yeah, I, I, I understand. That. I hear that. Yeah. Uh. 
<laughs> and yeah, so like so, some of the points oh, he made shit. in that interview are just completely ridiculous and just just not at all in line with the facts. Like at one point he said, "Oh, most Republicans don't even care about gay marriage anymore." Bullshit. And you look, at pol- you look, yeah, you look at polling data from right around the time of that interview, and you find that a majority of Republicans are opposed to gay marriage. So if you put it on the ballot, they would vote against it. So he he just makes a bunch of completely uh, non factual claims throughout that interview. Another point he made, he said. He was like, generally, I think the right wing is more tolerant of the left wing because I get way more invitations to speak at right wing organizations than left wing organizations. It's like, yeah, maybe that's because they view you as their ally in a lot of ways. Yeah, he's a useful idiot. And it's like he, yeah. they're not inviting him because they actually want to like pick his brain about what he thinks about politics. <laughs> it's because he will never challenge anybody that has anything insightful to say that might disagree with what he thinks. Like like that's that is the only reason they invite him to those things. Like, like it's not because hmm, he's some really interesting ideas from the left. Like, you know, we should have like a good, you know, intellectual debate about these things. Of course, that's not why I invite Dave Rubin. Dave Rubin's a fucking moron. <laughs> yeah. And plus, he, he spends half the time on his program, it seems like, bashing the left. So what, what, left wing, what left wing organization would be like, you know, who, who, who is going to headline our lineup of speakers defending left wing ideas? How about this guy that constantly bashes the left? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So it said that, um, what? What leftism or progressivism is like a mental illness, something like that, something crazy. Like, yeah, he said he said that at one point. I think in a conversation with Ben Shapiro, he oh later God. walked it back and he was like, "I was being hyperbolic." But what an outrageous statement to make! Yeah, exactly. Like, and like that's the like you're the one who preaches like you know tolerance of ideas, and you're so pithy. You're gonna actually say that an ideology you disagree with is a mental disorder. It's like, please, like spare me. Um, with that interview specifically though, like he he really had some strange things. Like like classical liberalism. Like you know, I was actually uninformed about this almost entirely until that interview, where like I I knew that classical liberalism and like you know OG libertarianism is like those are basically the same exact thing with like a couple yeah, social things similar. here, a couple social things here and there that are kind of different but economically they're they're pretty much synonymous and so like when he talked about like in universal health care that is something that does not exist in the idea of a classical liberal where anything that the free market is able to provide not well not bad not any kind of uh adjective you want to give just generally the government should have no role in that and it should be completely regulated by the free marketplace and so for him to say i'm basically for single-payer health care no, that that means you don't even understand the <laughs> ideology that you actually proclaim that you are. And right. so, and like honestly, that just kind of goes to the point where he's just a vapid guy. I don't think he really truly believes anything. I I think that I think that he's a person who found a market for people that like, you know, they want to say, "Oh, I agree with a left person, you know, so I'm not, you know, a, a right-wing ideologue or whatever. I agree with people on the left." And I think it's his. I think it's his role. I think he's a useful. I think it's a useful mouthpiece for people that actually want to be agreed with, which is just very strange. And like the fact that he has a, such a basic misunderstanding of what a classical liberal is and what universal healthcare actually means and how they're diametrically opposed is just hilarious. Yeah, I also wonder how much of that is him just sort of pandering to the audience. Like, obviously, David Pakman has a very left-wing audience, so maybe he was just sort of saying that to to, to gain a little sympathy and make it seem like there's sure. more ideological yeah. camaraderie. Whereas if he was on the Ben Shapiro show, he might be more— It's evil. It's for slavery. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know if he'd go that far, but he'd probably be more likely to, to be like, well, you know, I've been hearing some interesting ideas about right-wing proposals on healthcare. I, I feel like maybe some of that is just pandering to the audience— Maybe he genuinely does believe that single payer health care is what we should have. And if so, then uh, good for him, I guess. But it, like you said, it, it, it's not at all in alignment with the libertarian viewpoints that he holds. So there's or definitely supposedly a holds. There. I don't know if he even believes yeah. those things, to be honest with you, because like, wait, what was the thing he said in that review? It was something about like uh, capital gains rates or like uh, or capital costs like for um for his, for his studio and it's like i want you to be able to you know expense people to work for you and you know to make all the money that you possibly can and dave's like but dave isn't that a problem like everything you said is pretty much tax deductible like how can you hold those two th- right he's like um I, I hear that argument and i also would say that you do have the you know the right to keep all that you earn and i'm just like like like, how can you be that ill-equipped for an interview? I, I really, I'm curious because, like, <laughs> literally, David Pakman, he politely and nonchalantly just books every single thing that he brings up, and literally, right. he's like, "My budget, Pacman, do another time, sure." 
Like, yeah, I mean, it, it. Frankly, it was embarrassing, and his appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience oh. uh, a couple months ago was even worse. It was, it was just absolute well, self embarrassment. What was the thing he said? It was like uh, iPhones can replace like um, like uh, standards of regulation and stuff for like housing and shit. Yeah, oh. so they talked. They talked about two main things that really stuck out to me, and I, I did make a video uh, kind of debunking and laughing at some of these arguments on my channel. One was building codes, where Dave Rubin was basically advocating the idea that we don't need building codes and regulations because you can figure it all out yourself and the construction workers they, they want have, the things that are good yeah right yeah <laughs> they, they have the incentive to produce good building materials so that means they'll get more more business and so forth and we can just depend upon yelp reviews to to ascertain whether a construction company is reliable and joe rogan just gave some serious pushback where he was like no dude i've been in the construction industry for years and so was my father and you're just completely wrong about this and, and he just crumbles yeah, against and, the and most the, basic and he, pushback and then he walks back where he's like well i'm not calling for all regulation right. but i think you can make a very sound argument okay the sound argument you made supposedly sound was just literally taken in front of you broken its back and drank the spinal fluid that's basically what happened and then the, the fact that you're something i genuinely believe that there are better ways to do better than the government and joe rogan actually credit to him like he like, like you know he's somebody who's a good friend of dave rubens for a while and i don't think they've actually had a relationship since that interview but like basically like he completely like dissected everything that he said and then he still i'm not calling for that but i genuinely believe that that's probably the answer how can you do that like like how can you be you know, shown, something else yeah. he was doing he was like hiding behind other people to make the point i don't know if you remember but the way he framed it he was like well i've been hearing a lot of interesting people on the right wing who have presented these ideas and he was like i'm not actually calling for this i just think it's an intellectually interesting exercise to talk about it's like dude it really sounded like you were calling for it about five minutes ago yeah and what it really seems to me like he just got his ass handed to him in the exchange and that forced him to walk back his position and make it seem like, OK, maybe I'm not yeah. actually calling for this. That That's what it seemed like was happening to me. Yeah. Like in, um, what was the thing you said where it's like, a, you know, poisoning of rivers, like because we have like iPhones and Snapchat and Instagram and Periscope, like people can live stream those things. And yeah. therefore they can like, you know, be taken to the authorities and stuff. And legitimately like, okay even if we grant that that premise is like you know somewhat effective how many rivers have to be poisoned and how many environments have to be destroyed before those things self-regulate like exactly like, like for example like let's say the fda they got rid of all the, the the meat packaging requirements and like the hygienic standards for food and let's say like a chicken restaurant starts serving fried bats like you know anchorman for example that's a plot point in the second anchorman that's very funny but like how many restaurants have to serve fried bats before people complain on Yelp and then basically the restaurant goes out of business? Where it's like, why can't we have compliant standards all the way through? And of course, we don't want to like, you know, stifle growth and, and, and economic growth and stuff. But the fact that we even have to debate about whether or not we have a standard of care for people in terms of regulation of the marketplace is foolish to me because those things will not self-regulate because there is no consideration of environmental um, environmental conservation on someone's balance sheet. Like there's no incentive for that unless you actually have an incentive from the government. And yeah, man, it, it, it's it, like, there's just so much wrong with that whole like non-aggression principle where um, I don't think it's really a debatable topic. And the fact that people try to couch it as one is just kind of sad. <laughs> I think it's really worth just like jumping in the clown car with Dave Rubin and really thinking about what it would be like if, if we depended upon, Yelp reviews and Twitter posts to determine that a company is polluting a river. Like, number one, this the assumption built into this is that you're going to have this pipe that's protruding like five feet above the water, dumping cartoonishly bright green chemicals <laughs> visible from the water line where people are walking, where there's a, a bright yellow sign that says like danger, toxic chemicals that will cause cancer. Yeah. And, 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 and then as soon as it's the water, like dead fish pop up and like the yeah. whole thing turns like blue and shit. Like what the fuck, man? And oh. In reality, what's going to happen is the pipe is going to be underwater. It's not going to be visible to the public. So who is going to take it upon themselves if we don't have government regulators to canoe over there and paddle over there on their day off work to test the water test the chemicals figure out what what the source of this is to determine yeah. how harmful it is it's just completely unrealistic and it's dependent upon your social media post basically going viral enough to convince this company that if they don't change their ways, then it's going to be uh, economically yeah. detrimental to them. There are just so many unrealistic assumptions built into this worldview. It's 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 a fantasy. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and like, it's just 
it's like you said, he views like that whole thing. It, I think it's like the premise in the Simpsons. I want to say where it's like in the, in the, the movie like they poison the lake. And then like, as soon as like a drop hits the water, a skull and crossbones like flies up and stuff. Right. <laughs> I feel like he views like government, like a uh, government sanctioned, like pollution stuff like that. I feel like he views it like that, where it's like almost like a cartoon and right. like, like, like th- those things aren't going to happen. Like the thing with like, the food I brought up, for example, like just because you have like, you know, FDA non-compliant meat doesn't mean it's not going to taste good in the moment. But when you get E. coli a couple weeks later, then of course you're going to realize that, oh shit, what I ate has an actual detriment to my health. So how many people have to experience, you know, poisonous water? How many people have to eat things that get, make them very, very sick? How many products that don't have any kind of regulation have to um, abused the consumer in a negative way. And yeah, like th- those just aren't tenable positions. And, and like you said, it's built on just so many things being baked into the premise. Like, okay, as soon as they start polluting, people are going to like sit there with a periscope open and like, you know, yeah. stream it and stuff. Yeah, man. Fuck. Like, uh, there, there was another thing he said that was really stupid about, um, fuck. I, I think it was, I, I want to say it was like the Baker with the gay marriage thing. I think he said something really stupid about that as well. Like, um, he was talking about how, um, you know, uh, if, if you don't like, um, if you don't like, uh, the Baker, whatever, move to another town or something like that. But like, like, like the, the, the complete disregard of like protected classes under the civil rights act and stuff like, like, like as a gay person, how could he like just make that in good faith? Or uh, of course it's not in good faith, but like, how could he, how could he, guilt free spew that and like not feel like the biggest piece of shit of all time by saying that stuff. <laughs> you know what I think was one of the most humiliating things I've ever seen is when he had Ben Shapiro on uh, the Ruben report <clears throat> and he just flat out asked him to his face. He was like, you know, Ben Shapiro, you're, uh, you're a fundamentalist religious person or whatever. You're an Orthodox uh, Jew. You might be opposed to homosexuality, but he, he asked Ben Shapiro, he was like, if I had an anniversary with my gay husband, you would come to it, right? Oh and Ben, God, Sh- ben Shapiro, that. to his face, he was like, you know, I would actually have to think about that. And <laughs> this is somebody he considers a friend, yeah. an ally, and he's like, your very nature sickens me, and I think it's immoral and wrong. What kind of a self-respecting person can be talked to like that and can call a person like that a friend when he views you uh, as fundamentally flawed and vile like that? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know... Uh... I think he said, like, you know, like, I don't care if you find me sinful, like religious people, when they find somebody sinful, that means that they are so repugnant that they don't even deserve the grace of God. And for them, that's like the biggest insult of all time. And so it's like, fuck, like, how can you look at that guy in the face and not think he's a piece of shit? (laughs) Like, unless he secretly does. And he's like, yeah, fuck this guy. But like the coke money is really just coming in and doesn't really give a fuck about any of that. But uh, possible. Yeah, I, I think it's more. I think it's probable too. <laughs> like, uh, oh man, um, I wanted to make one more uh, one more point about Dave Rubin. At, l- at least one more point. Bring the hammer this, down. Do it. This, this it's just kind of a silly point, but <clears throat> I think it's funny that he he really seems to like to label himself with these these really intense sounding terms like. I'm a part of the new center, part of the intellectual dark, dark web. web. Like, yeah, like he 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 seems to really enjoy applying to himself these terms that make it seem like he's part of this daring vanguard that's you know challenging conventional wisdom and just like really doing something brave and uniquely deserving of praise. When it, I don't really see him doing anything that spectacular, he's basically just having conversations with people and he frames it. He's like, I just want to talk about ideas, bro. It's like, yeah, Dave, that's what people do when they have conversations. <laughs> they talk about ideas. You're not, I don't really see him doing anything all that unique. And I, I think it's funny to imagine other people doing something similar. Like, you know, you and I, we accept the climate change consensus. We're passionate about the subject. Imagine if we came up with some sort of ridiculous terminology where we, we're like, we are the brotherhood of reason. <laughs> or like, <laughs> we are the legion of rationality. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous on its face to imagine. Yeah, he, he calls himself, you know, like a member of the intellectual dark web. I, I just think it's goofy and uh, just worth laughing at. Oh, yeah, it's so goofy. And also, like, he's somebody who, like, associates himself with people that, like, you know, hate labels and stuff. Stuff, but nobody loves labels right. more than Dave Rubin. <laughs> like literally, the regressive left, like you know, are not progressive but regressive. And I'm an I, and I'm a an intellectual, uh, you know, uh, absolutist and a free speech <laughs> advocate. But I'm also a classical liberal. I'm part of the intellectual dark web. It's like, like he is he always like you know attacks people for using like you know you're gonna reduce somebody to labels and you're gonna reduce somebody to like a term and stuff. And literally, you're the label king. Like you've like you have a yeah. back room and you just have like little like staples like labels and. Right. 
right. <laughs> post on people. And like the fact that you were able to confer all those labels on other people and yourself <laughs> and then attack people for using labels in the first place, it just kind of proves how intellectually vapid he really is. Here's another good example of that. He claims to be all about free speech and opposed to safe spaces. This guy blocks more people on Twitter <laughs> than anybody I've ever encountered. Have you got like, blocked? Oh, he blocked me uh, like four months ago. Nice. Yeah, I was tweeting at him. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was before, I think it was before Politicon. I thought he was one of the people that would be there. And I was tweeting at him. I was saying like, you're probably just going to, you know, regurgitate the same three boring, uninteresting talking points you've been making about how SJWs are bad. Free speech is important. You know, sure, uh, he makes some good points, but these are just really basic ideas that aren't very original or intellectually stimulating. And yeah. I, I was just, I was just kind of shitting on his basic approach and he blocked me. He blocks so many fucking people click on any post that tags at Ruben report and you'll see like a dozen people saying screenshot the the tweet I can't see it because he blocks me he blocks so many people so he creates this intellectual safe space for himself on Twitter then he goes onto his program and condemns safe spaces and talks about how important it is to engage in the battle of ideas that he runs away from by constantly blocking people who are criticizing him it's ridiculous dude two things so one do you know the progressive voice by any chance uh, do, do I know what the progressive voice He's a YouTube channel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, had some funny videos on Dave Rubin and stuff. And basically, like, <laughs> he's made like a meme account on Instagram where literally he just makes memes about Dave Rubin and shit. And <laughs> legitimately, like, I think Ruben like excommunicated and blocked him on legitimately everything. And like, <laughs> he made this video where it's like, oh, my God, the memes, they were, they were too spicy for Dave Rubin. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, funny. But but number two, like uh, Ruben, like, do you have, have you seen like his subreddit? By any chance? Yeah. Yeah. I Dude, have. like that that place like has just become dedicated to shitting on him. Like yep. like I think Sam Cedar, like a, a caller to his show, like was talking about like literally I think to quote him, like, it's become a haven to dunking on him, where literally there hasn't been a post in like forever, like you're a grifter, you're a fraud. Debate Sam Cedar, debate David Pacman, like you're a fraud. <laughs> like and the fact that like the official community that is yeah. like basically made to rally like with him is just shitting on him. That that's just delicious to me. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I can't imagine what it feels like to be him. Um and a lot of the people there are former Dave Rubin fans. When he started the Rubin report, I really enjoyed it. I was like, these are interesting conversations. He had Sam Harris on. He had he had some people on where they were having good conversations. But it, it just became this echo chamber where they kept repeating the same points. It just it just turned into the bashing of the left nonstop. And after a while, I was like, man, this guy has just he's gone off the fucking deep end. Yeah, dude. And I, I, that's I, how it is on the subreddit. A lot of people, it's just former fans who who became disillusioned. Yeah, dude. And um, I I actually I was the same way. Like I actually enjoyed some of the conversations he had. But when he started getting people like you know Lauren <coughs> Southern or Stefan Molyneux, people that are legitimately race realists and stuff, like that's when I'm like, okay, you're not doing this to have some kind of intellectually um intellectually stimulating conversation. You're doing it so you can give these people a mouthpiece and never challenge them in anything. It's like 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 you're not you're not contributing to the, to the political discourse in a positive way all you're doing is, is just basically you're giving an implicit approval to people that don't really need or even deserve a platform in my opinion i mean obviously i'm a free speech absolutist so i'm never going to censor anybody for what they believe but to bring somebody on and i have a very similar opinion to um um you know destiny the political youtuber like the gamer guy like destiny by any chance i don't watch a lot of his content but i'm familiar with yeah, him i have used basically similar to him where basically like i'm a very big believer in responsible platforming so like if you bring somebody on if you think there's a conversation to be had there do it like it can only serve you because you're going to like you know hone your skills as a debater as an interviewer and you're actually going to get good ideas out there but there's a implicit fucking statement in there that you have to make you're going to challenge somebody when they make things that are completely terrible or they're going to preach a hateful ideology if they come on there and you just don't question them on anything you are giving implicit approval to a set of ideas that could be very very harmful to people and so you have to be engaged as an interviewer to think okay i'm giving this person a platform i owe it to myself and my audience to actually challenge them did you see that dave rubin threatens to sue a writer for describing him as right wing in an article he threatened to sue him for libel because he describes he he characterized dave rubin as right wing this is a guy who's all about the battle of ideas and free speech and some guy i just think it's hilarious that it's it's just like endless hypocrisy with this guy and, and contradictions um he was he went on this tweet storm where he was like putting up the definition of libel and uh you know the, like the four legal requirements to be to be guilty of libel it's like dude you, you you're aligned with libertarianism on probably 80 90 percent of issues and you were on prager you 
on, in a video entitled Why I Left the Left, and he's outraged at being characterized as right wing. Uh, it's silly to me. Yeah, it's really silly. Yeah, I didn't know that, actually. That's pretty crazy. The fact that, like, he was going to, like, pull Donald Trump and, like, someone wrote something he didn't like. But and also, like, libel has to be not true. Re Rubin has said himself, like, he's become more libertarian on economic ideas. So, like, that's not like right. a that's not like a, a slanderous thing that he's doing. Like, he's not doing and it if maliciously. He's so, and if he's so opposed to the left, like, if he's constantly shitting on the left, why would he even want to be associated with them anyway? Why exactly. does he view... Right wing is a smear term if he's if he's apparently so outraged and disgusted by the left. Well, because like he wants to be like, I'm the left wing guy, but I'm like yeah. the rational left wing guy. And I'm like, no, you're not. You don't believe anything, dude. Like, you really don't like he, he had a Twitter banner for a while. It, it was like <laughs> the last real liberal or some stupid shit like that. <laughs> Before yeah. I get a fucking brain tumor, let's stop talking about him, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. So let's bring up a couple more topics. So um, we, we, we talked about basically um, we wanted to kind of go into the whole thing about um, conspiracy theories. And um, it was interesting in our, our original correspondence. You said that um, you actually were a bit of a 9-11 truther, I want to say, like, like way back in the day or something like that. Or like I was a huge 9-11 truther. Really? Not a bit. Of, I was a huge one. Very passionate about it. Knew all the arguments front to back. Debated it constantly. Really? Uh, so so please like, like talk a little bit about that, like your formation of those ideas and like how you actually got out of that that hole, I guess. Yeah, sure. So this was at a very young age. It wasn't like this was last weekend or whatever. Yeah, yeah this for is, sure. This I, was, I assumed. This was probably from, if I had to put like numbers on it, it was probably from about 14 years old to 17 years old. I, I was very active online though. So, I, you know, I was like constantly engaging with different viewpoints and debating people and so forth. And I went through this conspiracy theorist phase where that wasn't the only conspiracy theory I believed, but it was probably my main one. The reason that I believed it was probably the reason a lot of conspiracy theorists fall down the hole is I looked at the documentaries, I looked at the evidence, I found it convincing, but I only looked at one side of the conversation. Yeah. I was living inside of an echo chamber where I would go onto these forums where I would be talking with like-minded people. 95% of us agree with each other. It's just an echo chamber where we're constantly affirming each other's views. When a person comes in who disagrees with us, everyone dogpiles on him. Not at all a fair debate. You're getting affirmed with, you know, likes on the forums and so forth where you think, man, I'm fucking killing it. Everyone agrees with me. This is great. But really, I was just living inside of an echo chamber. I never actually took the time to thoroughly investigate the so-called official story. I never really carefully looked into counter arguments to my position. I knew all of the arguments front to back. I could I could, you know, make the case better than just about anybody. I debated it constantly online, but I never really did a careful uh, audit of my own views to see what was wrong with them. And the way that I escaped it was pretty much by just becoming a an all around the board better critical thinker. This was a gradual process. It yeah. wasn't like a one day event, but it's you know, I started out reading a lot of the atheist literature, atheism versus religion and so forth. From that I sort of branched into debunking of pseudoscience more generally, and then I just kind of branched out to to just really learning more about uh, how to think critically on a wide range of subjects. And that's that started to sort of bleed over into my former conspiracy theory views. So I started looking into it more. I started looking at the actual explanations for things, started looking at all the flaws in my logic. Excuse me. That I never really took into consideration. And uh, eventually I just got to the point where I was like, I don't believe this shit anymore. And I see just so many flaws with what I used to uh, accept. Yeah. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, of course, it's great because like I, I feel like the whole 9-11 truthism thing, it's like I, I mean, of course, you know, Occam's razor, like in symbolic logic, basically like the most easily arrived at or the easiest answer is probably the correct one like i just find i have a really difficult time believing like you know memes of you know george bush and shit aside like i really find it difficult to think that like there's this massive government conspiracy where all this stuff could be explained by these very minute details of the incident and um different vantage points of you know cell phone footage that was taken and stuff um like so do you was there any kind of argument that you heard from the actual you know 9-11 actual event side of things that actually caused you to question things or was it just generally as a thinker you evolved more i think more gen i think i think it was both actually i think it was a bit of both i think generally i became more skeptical critical thinking in nature and i began to apply that to views that i held instead of just applying it to things that i already came to the table disagreeing with i i got better at questioning what it is that i actually believed okay. that i think was part of it also uh, another key part of it was 
just really taking a close look at what it is that actually explains the collapse of the Twin Towers, for example. Yeah. I never really did that. You know, I spent months, maybe even years, like passionately believing in this, and I never really took the time to carefully look into the explanation for how structural damage plus the weakening of steel via fire could cause uh, the collapse of a building. And it, once once I did that, once I was actually presented with facts and counter arguments, I was like, man, you know, m my old position just doesn't really make any sense. And th that apply that applies. To, to all the different areas. It's not just like that one isolated area of the collapse of the towers, but all the different arguments. The more I looked into them, I just found that, that there was there was really no merit to them. Yeah, so I almost, I'm almost inf uninformed on 9-11 truth almost completely. Like, I know that there's a lot of things about, like, you know, using squibs and shit um, on, you know, like a, the, the vertical versus horizontal ejection of different debris and stuff. So what is, what is the argument that people actually use um, on you know 9-11 truth isn't the side of things that they actually vociferously believe that it's a conspiracy theory and how did you actually get yourself out of not believing you know, that specific argument so i would i would describe the basic position of most 9-11 truthers as holding the view that the twin towers and building seven were brought down by a controlled demolition as opposed to being brought down by damage from the planes and fire and structural damage that's the basic position you can branch off and talk about the Pentagon. There are conspiracies associated with that, conspiracies associated with Flight 93 uh, actually being shot down and so forth. But the the, the basic position is uh, focuses around the Twin Towers and World Trade Center 7. So what's interesting about truthism is – it actually is very technical. The arguments that they make, it's not just like some trash that they pull out of their ass. They make very technical arguments about, you know, the physics of the collapse of a building. They talk about chemical analysis of the debris, which contains, you know, microspheres of iron and things that can only be explained by uh, controlled demolition, thermite, things like that. So it, it's not like it's intellectually lazy. Uh, there, There is a lot of technical thought that goes into the, the arguments, but the thing is, it requires a really careful examination of specific arguments to be, to be able to see what's wrong with them. So I, I made a video recently about debunking the idea that squibs were seen during the collapse of the Twin Towers, which are like these little puffs of smoke you see below the current crush point that they, they think can only be explained by controlled demolitions. I also talk about the horizontal ejection of heavy debris, which they say, how could it be ejected horizontally if, if a building collapses gravitational and gravity works downwards? So these are technical arguments that they're making that require a careful look but uh I, I could just briefly run through some of the flaws in those particular arguments sure, go ahead. If, yeah, if you're please. interested yeah, yeah so so the squib the squib argument it's particularly interesting because their position the position of most truthers is that conventional explosives weren't used and they actually use thermite to bring down the towers thermite reacts by producing yep. uh you're a chemist i'm sure you're familiar yeah. with it. It, it it it's it's more like it would melt the steel instead of exactly. actually explode it in a controlled demolition so on the one hand, they're telling us we have these explosive puffs that are proof of a controlled demolition. On the other hand, they'll say the reason we didn't hear synchronized explosions like you hear in a controlled demolition is because thermite was used. So they have these competing contradictory ideas in their head that don't make sense. And also, they, they tell us that the core columns were the ones that were rigged with explosives, not the perimeter columns, because people working in the buildings could actually see the perimeter columns and interact with them. So there's no way you could rig those up. So they say the core columns were, were rigged with explosives. So that means impossible explosions happened. So you have an explosion in the center of the building. It sends debris in a perfectly straight path to exit out of only one window, which is like 80 feet away. That's completely impossible because explosions send debris in all directions. Exactly. Even a directional explosion would still break surrounding windows. So, you, so they're advocating impossible explosions caused by something that wasn't even meant to be explosive. So it's just fundamentally nonsensical. Yeah, for sure. And that, that's just one example. Yeah. So like, and, um, so, so what, so I guess, um, my question is like for nine 11 truthism, again, I'm, I'm almost uninformed this almost entirely, but, um, so do they believe that the tower, that the planes were actually hijacked by terrorists or did they believe that, that was actually orchestrated by the government who actually sanctioned people to be trained in Iraq or Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or different things. And then they actually take the planes and fly them in the towers or it's because the government actually realize that, oh shit, they're hit by planes, time to bring them down. You know, what's interesting about truthism is there's such a rich diversity of 
uh, ridiculous ideas that they hold. Some people say it wasn't actually a conventional uh, commercial jet, but it was actually a military cargo plane. Some say the planes were holograms. Some say that uh, that it was actually a missile that crashed into the Pentagon and not an airplane. Some, uh, oh, in terms of the hijackers, some say the planes were were on autopilot and they were controlled by robots and nobody was in them. Some say that the, the hijackers were government agents. So there are all kinds of different arguments. You can't exactly say like one particular thing is what they believe. There, there's a pretty wide range of uh, of what they accept. But the conventional viewpoint would be that uh, the planes struck the building. It was basically a government plot to to make it look like the planes caused the damage when really a controlled demolition brought down the buildings. And the mass death and devastation that we saw as a result of that was used by the government as the basis to invade the Middle East, to pass the Patriot Act, to do things like that. And uh, so, the, so the planes were basically a red herring. It was like... Uh, a diversion, if you will, where it's like the planes yeah. hit up there, and it made it. It made the people think that that's what caused them to collapse. It was really, yeah, it was sure. a planned demolition. Yeah, that's that's basically what they believe. God, like you got to jump through so many different holes of logic to actually believe something like that. So it, it, it's it, it's great that you actually like convince yourself that like it was a forest. That uh, you know that, that's that's good. Um, yeah, man. Um, so now they're on the subject. So. Do you think like there's any credence to any kind of conspiratorial thinking where obviously like, of course, we should question things that come from authority and stuff. But like this whole rampant idea of conspiratorial thinking that's perceived, you know, basically pervaded by, you know, people like Stefan Molyneux and people like Alex Jones. Like, 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 what do you think is the real danger aside from, of course, like just the dispelling of reality and like logical fact? What do you think is the real danger of this conspiratorial thinking for sure? I guess it depends on the individual conspiracy. Sometimes you could argue it's the only harm is really that a person is wasting their life believing nonsense. Yeah. Sometimes people might act upon their conspiratorial beliefs. This is extremely rare, though, if you have like some nut job trying, you know, shoot up the Bush administration because he thinks it was uh, an inside job. Things like that are pretty rare. So it, you you have to take it based upon what kind of conspiracy we're talking about. Um Oftentimes, I think the harm is just that a person is wasting their life believing rubbish, but that's harm enough for me to think uh, that we, we should try to to uh, to get them to reconsider their beliefs and and uh, no longer accept those ideas. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's only the only thing you can do. You have to be, become more informed in what you actually choose to speak about. Um, but yeah, it's like we said, like this kind of like uh, this this anti intellectual movement is really kind of promulgating a lot of dangerous side effects. Like people that believe in conspiracy theories, people that don't even try and like understand issues from an opposing viewpoint. Um, yeah, it, it's really deeply troubling. I mean, when you look at the actual the extremes of something like conspiracy thinking, but also just generally people equipped with, uh, people not equipped for political discourse in in any kind of rational way. Um, yeah, like uh, so. I guess moving on, um, because, you know, obviously the non truthism is interesting, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we only have a limited amount of time here. Yeah, sure. So um, I would say that. So we're seeing kind of this rift in the Democratic Party where we have this kind of pro corporate versus anti corporate agenda that's kind of intersecting. You know, obviously, the, the poster child of that is um, Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton. One is uh, a populist and one's kind of anti-establishment. The other is the capitulation of everything that is corporate and is special interest and is uh, kind of this Washington insider. And so we're seeing more and more candidates that are on kind of the pro-establishment side of things that are, I guess... I guess they're, I don't know if pandering is the right word, but like they're, they're portraying themselves as like, as, as supporting ideas they may not necessarily agree with. So for example, someone like Kamala Harris, who has, you know, advocated for the private system of healthcare for a long, long time. And now recently has come out for Medicare for all same thing with Cory Booker, but of course he's walked back in that even more so than Kamala Harris has. Um, what do you think of this whole rhetoric game that people on the pro establishment side of the Democratic Party are playing right now? Do you think they genuinely are going to try and push for progressive policies or it's just a political football where they're going to get into office and then like really kind of stab people at the vote of them in the back? Yeah, I think it's a really important question to to ask before you vote for somebody uh, and when you're considering who to vote for. Um, it's hard to say because, you know, none of us can read minds, but. Yeah. I I tend to lean. I'm just I've become so disillusioned and cynical, just observing and learning about the political process that when you have these establishments 
politicians or establishment leaning politicians who sort of see the light and, uh, you know, adopt more progressive viewpoints. I'm maybe unjustifiably, I'm always a little skeptical of that. And I always think maybe they're just telling people what they want to hear so that they can get elected. And then once they actually get into office, they're not going to back those ideas that they uh, paid lip service to during the primaries. Um, arguably, even with Barack Obama, this is what we saw, where he he ran a very populist, progressive, left-leaning campaign. Yeah. Once he got into office, even with a supermajority, we got this really this really watered-down, lukewarm health care reform that was originally a right-wing idea. Heritage Foundation and, appealed papers on it. Yeah, yeah. Stupid. Yeah, just, so that, that's just one example of where the rhetoric just didn't match the actual actions that we see once he got elected into office. So I do worry that if it's a politician that's is establishment leaning. If it's somebody that you're that that you have a hard time trusting, I think it, I think it's totally uh, valid to be skeptical of them. I I'm a supporter of politicians who don't just talk the talk, but I I actually look at their actions, I look at their voting record, I look at their history, uh, and I look at their character, and I think I can actually trust this person. Bernie Sanders that that's the one person that really stands out to me as yeah. a person who who doesn't just talk about these views, but for decades has held these views, has been fighting for them, and I genuinely trust him to to not be corrupted. Some might say that's naive, but I think if you just look at the rhetoric, if you look at the passion throughout his entire political career, I think I think he actually has the actions to back it up. So he's the one person I really trust. Maybe. These centrist establishment politicians genuinely are evolving and changing, and if so, that's great. But they're certainly not going to be uh, uh, the first people I, I rush to vote for. No, for sure, I, I totally agree with that. And um, it, I like the point you brought up, where it's like you can have somebody that talks to talk all day. I mean, l l look at uh, Hillary Clinton, for example. In a recent interview with, um, I think it was CNN or something, you know, something like that, she was talking about Kamala Harris, and she's like, "Look, I've been a proponent of universal health care my entire career." I'm like, that's factually not true. Like you were for universal health care and then you took a bunch of money from big pharma and the healthcare industry and then you went back against that and railed against it. So like you can't just like you can't just say things that are so easily disprovable. Like it, it's just it's strange that people think it's like 1992 and like people can't Google shit that you've said. Right. And, like, people can't read <laughs> what you've done. Like, like, you know, 538, for example, I have my problems with them, but they actually keep, you know, records of, you know, people that people vote in certain ways and people actually tabulate that, which is great. But the thing that like, really pisses me off, it's like if you're going to oppose somebody, you can't just do so in terms of rhetoric. Like you have to do it in terms of the way you vote and the way you actually advocate for certain policies. For example, on the Republican side of things, someone like Jeff Flake. Jeff Flake has been the most anti-Trump guy you could ever imagine. And he has voted with Trump. I think it's 87 percent of the time on all the issues. So you can't just be anti-Trump in terms of his mean tweets and his tone and his stupidity. You, you, you can't couch yourself as a person who's actually opposed to him unless you actually are viscerally opposed to what he chooses to do. If, and like, honestly, like you can't couch yourself as like being anti-Trump and then just decorum police him. Like that's just, that's so, it's so damaging for actually for, for just discourse generally, because you're not actually standing up for what you believe in. You're just saying, I'm opposed to this one person's ideology in this specific way, which doesn't really affect how I'm going to vote. So like you can't you can't proclaim yourself as like this kind of ideologue, but then just capitulate to whatever he does. It's just silly. Yeah, you kind of cut out there at the end, but I I, I caught the gist of it. Um, yeah, sorry, but <laughs> my my, my oh, fucking my microphone's in, in, is shit. But uh, oh no, it's better now. Uh, it, oh, correct. It's, correct. So anyway, um, yeah, you saw you saw something similar with John McCain, the so-called maverick, who who was constantly portrayed as being you know bucking Republican orthodoxy. Same thing with him. You look at his voting record; it's something like ninety percent of the time he's voting in line with the GOP. That doesn't sound like a maverick to me. To uh, to his credit, towards the end of his life and political career, he did. Yeah cast some important votes uh Obama i'm pretty sure he, for one of them yeah 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 he, i think he was the vote that saved uh certain provisions of obamacare i can't recall the exact he was specifics. the only republican that voted against him the only one everyone else has voted for it which is just like that's crazy the fact that mccain is somebody who's been seen as like you know the gop's kind of like you know uh, bulldog so to speak yeah. and then you know he hated trump so much that he just turned on him completely which honestly for, for whatever reason he did it. i'm glad that he voted the right way but of course we can always speculate on his motives for that Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Um, so because this, the, uh, I guess 
segueing from our previous point because like the establishment also has that massive uh, amount of political capital and actual just regular capital and money behind them they of course are at an institutional advantage for all their elections and all their political endeavors and even though progressive ideology and and really populist policies are so popular like medicare for all um, ending the wars legalizing marijuana um, tuition free um, uh, public schools um even though that all these things are so tenable and so popular, they're not given their day in the sun because obviously we don't have the money or, or I guess just progressive movements in general don't have the money behind them. So looking as a person who, you know, I consider myself fairly politically informed and you obviously do this for basically a living at this point. So you're, you're very well informed. How do, how do progressives and really just people who have a political ideology in general that's underrepresented how do they actually go about implementing their policies in an effective way when they're at such a disadvantage monetarily well first i'd say i wish i did this for a living unfortunately i'm stuck working a day job to pay the bills but uh <laughs> hopefully hopefully that'll change at some i'm sure point well, in man, the you, you make awesome content yeah you, you do great stuff appreciate that but uh to answer your question how how can progressives um basically implement their policies if they're at a financial disadvantage. Well, I think the key is getting money out of politics, but there is kind of a catch-22 there where it's like the progressive people who want to get money out of politics are at a disadvantage. So how are they going to implement these ideas if they don't get elected because they're at a disadvantage? You know, yeah. th there, there's there's kind of like a, there's a bit of a problem there. But I, I guess, you know, what can we do except get big money out of politics? Because un until, until we do, it's going to keep polluting our elections. It's going to keep corrupting candidates. And people are going to basically do the bidding of their donors. So that, that really is uh, the solution. And it, it, it's not just like this isolated thing where, you know, people often talk about money in politics in isolation. But it really does affect all political questions. Because whether we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about regulations, whether we're talking about research being funded, whatever it is, these big money donors are impacting politicians and their votes on all of these different questions. So it really is one of the bedrock issues that we need to deal with. And uh, I, I, f I feel like there is some momentum. I feel like there's a lot of traction. I feel like people in this country are at an all-time high in terms of believing that political corruption is such a problem. And that's why we're seeing in presidential debates and primaries, you're seeing all of this populist rhetoric, all of this talk, even from people who clearly have been corrupted, like Hillary Clinton, I would argue she, she, she was corrupted by all of the big money donors and so forth. Even people like her, even people on the right wing during the primaries, they talk about the importance of getting money out of politics and so forth. So I, I, feel, I feel like we are moving in this direction. We're also having a lot of far left candidates like Justice Democrats and uh, our revolution candidates. Many of them are starting to get elected. And on top of that, these establishment figures who are running for office, they're, they're sort of adopting this rhetoric. Even if they don't believe it, they're paying lip service to the idea that we need to get money out of politics. So I feel like the momentum is there. Um, so hopefully we will get to a point where we can, we can, uh, clamp down on, uh, the influence of money in politics. Cause, uh, like I said, it's just so fundamental. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with that. And at the end of the day, I mean, we can, you know, we can talk about any kind of rhetorical changes that we want, but really that's the big key at the end of the day, because, um, unless we actually remove the incentive to become corrupt and to become a special interest kind of candidate, we're never going to see any kind of change ideologically with that party for sure. Um, and, and honestly, like you said, I mean, it, it should be a, a nonpartisan thing. It should be just generally in politics. People should get rid of it. But the problem is um, a lot of people on the right benefit from having money in politics in a massive, massive way, because a lot of the special interests advocate for, you know, skirting regulations. A lot of people that are in the, you know, the fossil fuel industry would, would benefit tremendously if they were able to pay off people on the right wing to preach climate change denialism. And so, um, you know, that's going to have uh, a lot of people on the right wing, especially kind of go against their own interests because all of those groups really, you know, well, not all of them, but, but a lot of them are really interested in keeping that kind of status quo where a minimal um, invasion of the government is really key for their kind of political prosperous career. Yeah, for sure. Totally agreed. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, man, this has been great. I mean, we've been doing this for about two hours now, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, any kind of last minute issues you want to talk about or any kind of uh, closing thoughts or anything? No, not really, man. It was a really good conversation. I think we covered a lot of important grounds. Um, definitely talked about a lot of interesting questions. I made a lot of the key points I wanted to make on the subjects. So uh, I think it was a great conversation. We should definitely do it again sometime. I guess uh, 
I could plug my channel once again. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's just yeah. a skeptical human. Just search a skeptical human on YouTube. You'll find me. I, so I actually release my content in three different ways. I have a website, theskepticalhuman.com, where I release a largely text version of my content for people who prefer reading if it's quicker for you or whatever. And, you know, I, I post appropriate images and graphs and so forth as necessary. I also uh, release just like pure audio and podcast form, which you can get from iTunes, wherever you get your podcast and uh, YouTube. Just uh, search a skeptical human on Twitter at a skeptical human. And uh, yeah, that's that's where you can find me. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we definitely were aligned with basically everything that we talked about. And I really enjoyed this, man. You're uh, you're a really conversational guy and uh, super well informed. And you definitely are doing some awesome work, especially with climate change, but basically with all your channel. Big fan. And um, yeah, I'll see this again sometime soon, man. For sure. Thanks again for having me. All right. Lone Chemist Podcast. This has been a Skeptical Human. His name is Anton. And check out his stuff. Seriously, it's great. Thanks a lot, man. See you later. Yeah, you too.